Okay, so this is Danimal from the Rob Ross, and the interview you're about to see I think is super valuable. The camera cut off a few times if you're watching it on YouTube, and we just put some pictures up. So the audio is fine. Epic interview from one of the most influential, inspiring people I've ever met, especially when it comes to abundance and wealth and health and actually really inviting financial abundance into your life. Um, so highly encourage you to watch it all the way through and then I highly encourage you to take action on it. Turn that knowledge into wisdom. Practice what you learned. And a uh, quick reminder, if you want to join us on any of our next adventures, the next one's October 16th to the 20th in Austin in October, which I think is the best month to be there. Spring into fall with us or join and or we have a doctor from Canada actually coming to both. Join us in Costa Rica October 24th to the 28th. Or, you know, start the new year in the Virgin Islands, uh, January 2nd to the 6th. Um, email us at robberoz at gmail.com. And if you're feeling inspired to take action on pursuing your passion after watching this video, I can't stress it enough. Just do it. All right. Enjoy it. Peace. We actually just started this video, but we got so excited, I think, about being with each other, making a video. Then uh, we decided to settle down, say a prayer, and now we're going to restart. So this is my good friend Brandon Hopp, who does uh, conferences and almost seminars or yeah. workshops, we call them play shops, um, but they're also very heavy hitting, just like ours, and they are really about, you can correct me if I'm wrong, on the way losing your mind and connecting to your hearts as well. For sure. So we do very similar work, um, and he's definitely a huge inspiration for me and I hope vice versa, and I got to attend one of his conferences and I took a lot of notes that were the hardest hitting part for me, so I wanted to go over them with the man himself before he takes off to Texas for his new next event. Um, but before I do, do you want to give a brief introduction, like in your own words? Yeah. What do you all do with the you training and yourself and what you're passionate about? Yeah. First of all, I just want to thank uh, the animal, T Mango, Nate Dog, aka Sticky Fingers. <laughs> Uh, I've so enjoyed their friendship and just want to say thank you for uh, just the opportunity to communicate and connect with your audience and uh, just really enjoy our friendship and our connection so for sure thanks Dan. this is a man that I definitely sometimes uh, even feel a little insecure around because I think his message is so powerful but that in my opinion like if I was gonna be driven by that like imagine if I was like oh you have a lot of good things to say so I don't want he's competition I don't want to I don't want to let him give his gift to our audience. But I think that would be me being used by my mind, or my ego, or whatever the terminology of the day is. Yeah. But I think there's something much more deeper that when I can really sit back and appreciate you for the love of God that you have in your heart and that you have tapped into giving your gifts in a very powerful way, that we can more have a cooperation rather than a competition. Yeah. So I hope he blows you away here. I think that's. I what, hope I get jealous. I think. <laughs> I think that's what the world is moving to. You can feel it, uh, where we've been in such a place of competition that's ruled by the survival mindset, and I think the. I, I really feel like the world is evolving into a place of uh, the new competition, like you said, is cooperation, and it really feels like for us to not. We're not just about surviving anymore. We're now about thriving. And I think cooperation really helps uh, a person thrive. And one thing I love about Danimal is he's always willing to push past uh, his fears and insecurities. Obviously, he does not promote perfection. And, uh, but what he, what he is, I can tell you this about Danimal, he's always willing to push past his insecurities and really deal with his own fears. And so that's what I love about you, man. So that's thank good. you for that. That to me. I'm sure that's what you love about yourself as well. Well, I I, I, I do. That's, that's a good point. Maybe you're, we're mirrors uh, for each other. Yeah, so. and it actually reminded me. Right, I remember taking this note. I don't have to look at it. It's something your mom said. His parents came to the conference that I went to, which I thought was super cool. Hopefully, our parents make it to one of our retreats in the future. But she said. Uh, Connection over perfection. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, dang, that's a good one. That's yeah. one of those sayings that Rob Rosal will just go ahead and take it. That's <laughs> long. Hey, I'm telling you, experience everything. That's <laughs> a, I, I love that that you know, we were praying right before we got on on, on camera and 
I just, my prayer for everyone out there in YouTube land is that you, you would experience the love of God that blows your mind. And that you would experience a love on this video that's like no other that you've experienced. And I love that about Danimal. Lose your mind and experience everything. And uh, I think that's, you know, the Apostle Paul in the Bible talked about uh, experiencing a love that blows your mind. And so I love that animal. That's awesome. And this is a, a past pastor. What's the terminology yeah. for a guy in the South? A preacher, pastor? Yeah, I was a I was a pastor, pastor, uh, okay. a senior pastor of a church in Texas. And before we moved out to California and started our uh, life coaching business and our conference business, and uh, so yeah, now I'm uh, working with uh, executives uh, from all over the country and. I work with people that aren't executives as well, but it looks like what, where my business is going. I'm starting to work with, uh, yeah, the, the, the bigger the type A, the bigger the visionary, the better for uh, what we do. Hmm. So what I'm hearing from that is maybe you thought this was a uh, more effective strategy. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. A more effective strategy of getting your word and your message out there was by impacting more influential people than just the yeah. church. Or how did you make that transition from being a pastor to doing this now? Yeah, uh, the transition was uh, the structure of a business was more conducive to where I was at personally. And um, I really wanted to work with, uh, yeah, influential people, not just people that come to my church, but people that I can go out to. Uh, I think uh, what they're, they're, they're mind molders, guys that really impact massive structures and uh, yeah I wanted to connect with those guys and really influence uh, those guys and gals and so uh, that's what's happening I also just honestly if, I know Daniel and I both believe in, in just raw honesty uh, I wanted to make uh, more money than what I was making mm. and that's good that's good honesty yeah. and as a pastor you're kind of limited to a certain amount of money uh, that you can make and I I saw um, I felt like the business uh, business structure was better for what I was wanting to do. So, and so I'm happy you brought that up because I do want if anyone's feeling like they might be wanting to tune out right now and you're more interested in the financial aspect of this. You, Brandon's definitely had some very paradigm shifting perspectives for my financial mindset and heart set that I think have been very positive for me and have brought more financial abundance, not only into my life, but other people's lives. So I definitely want you to stay tuned for that. I want to talk to you about that yeah, before sure. this is over. Um, but I do want to go over some of these notes, and I do appreciate you for your honesty, for sure. Yeah. We'll try to get as much of that as we can in here. Hmm. Oh, that, that felt maybe not true. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, you know when someone's not telling the truth is when they say they never lie. <laughs> I'm like, oh gosh. Let me be honest. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, well, is, that's the first, uh, first step, you know, this person's obviously Never not. and always uh, indicate a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's this famous uh, Mark Twain quote that someone please comment below whether we're this on a YouTube channel or a Facebook video or whatever this is, a podcast. The, what is that quote? It's like something that Mark Twain said that I, I, can know, I know a man's lying to me when he tell, tells me he never lies. Or I know I can't trust a man when he tells me he never lies. Yeah. But at least we're, you know, we're trying to bring a lot of awareness and acceptance and action on these stories we might be telling ourselves and others. That being said, um, let's start with uh, the idea that you really pressed home that you are not your function. Yeah. I actually called it the, I don't think you use this terminology, but I uh, made an acronym, FBI, Function Based Identity. Ooh, man, look at that <laughs> animal. I let love me, it. Let me know, talk about Come that. On. What is this, FBI? Function Based Identity. <laughs> Yes, FBI is when we are uh, we take on our uh, function or our gift or what we do as uh, as who we are. And you know, uh, I was a, my, before I was a pastor, I was a professional tennis player, and so I took on that identity that I was a I, I am a tennis player. I am an elite athlete, and that is who I am. And you know what? That's not who I was. It was a part of me, but I, I'm so much bigger than that. And when we tie ourselves to FBI, yeah. 
When we tie ourselves to the FBI function-based identity, what happens is we really cap ourselves. And, uh, and, and what happens, man, when I lose a match? What happens when I do not perform well? What happens when my function goes down the drain or my knees go out? Yeah, I was about to say, what happens when you get injured? Yeah, and that's what happened. Then my identity goes down the tubes. And it may not be ath- athletics for you. It may be, uh, you may be extremely intelligent. It may be uh, you're a great musician. It may be you're a homemaker. But when you attach yourself to an identification, when you attach yourself with function or a role, you automatically step into a place of limitation. I, I know we do that because of protection. It feels like that protects us, but it really doesn't. It keeps it, FBI keeps connection out, mm. not in. It's so tempting though. Like even like how about mother like. You know, mothers. I'm a mother. Yes. People talk about that a lot. That's I mean, right. And it seems not. It seems like a good, it's sweet. You're much. She yes. is a mother. Don't I am it. the provider. <laughs> you know that 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 sounds awesome. Uh, as at, for a male, I am the provider of my family. But automatically, you have just limited yourself to being provider. And what happens if you need to break out of that to grow? And uh, you know, oftentimes to grow, we have to subtract. Hmm. And uh, what happens? What happens uh, when you attach yourself to a role, uh, especially like provider or mom? You won't subtract, therefore you won't grow. And so, really, when we when we do that, we hinder ourselves from the growth and the elevation that really wants to take place in our life. So, what are you? What am I? Yeah. Then I. You People know, to ask. What are, yeah. What do you, what do you do? First of all, what, first, what, what do you do? If I ask you that question, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, that's the most common. Hey, how nice yeah. to meet you. What do you do? Yeah, I, I think that I am a, uh, I am an inspirational person that has transformational processes of connection, and uh, I get to do that uh, whether I'm with my wife or with my kids or if like I'm going to Texas to do a conference, but. I've noticed in my life, uh, you know, what I, my, my function is, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an, inspirational, uh, an inspirational speaker and an in, inspirational just person. I think who I am at the core of me is I am loving and I'm very compassionate and I'm very good. Uh, I, I wrote a blog this morning about how uh, if uh, an apple tree bears apples, and if I am God's child, God is completely love and completely good, so therefore I'm going to be completely love and completely good. God uh, doesn't produce uh, Brussels sprouts when he's an apple tree. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's just so tempting. And you know, you hear it all the time, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a vegan, I'm a paleo, I'm a crossfitter, like people just love categorizing themselves, whether it's a job or whether it's a hobby, I'm a surfer. Um, what do you think that, like, do you have any philosophy or psychology on that? Like why is it that we people, humans, want us to throw ourselves in a categorize? Yeah, I think we really, at, the, at, at our greatest, le- or at the bottom level of us, we, we really want certainty. You know, mm-hmm. certainty is massive. And so what happens is that I, th- I believe that role or that performance-based identification or function-based identification gives us certainty. Mm-hmm. And uh, but but to reach our dreams, to reach our dreams, we now have to transcend into the next level, which is uh, uncertainty. That's where our dreams lie. And so to go after what you really really want, uh, you have to leave that role and leave that function. Hard part of with that is we've used that to protect our heart. We've used performance based identification or function based identification to protect ourselves. I'm Brandon, the tennis player. So that's who I am and I present myself like that to the world. Why? Why? So that uh, you will like me and you will connect to me and you go, oh, he's special. And why is that accepted in the West? It's especially accepted in the West because uh, we, we come from a mind and body uh, kind of mentality. So it's all about producing. It's all about performance. So your performance and who you are through your performance is, is very accepted and so especially if you can really build it up and it's you know a professional tennis player or 
a world-class surfer or whatever, then you're really going to be accepted for your performance. And, but, the, but the problem with that is at the end of the day, it leaves you alone. Mm -hmm. And that, it left me really alone left me very dis... I had a lot of people around me, and this is, you know, I want I want to just, to everyone out there, uh, if you're watching, uh, I had a lot of people around me, but I felt very alone. And I even feel kind of in my intuition right now, there's a lot of people out there that, that, that you've had people around you. You've had a lot of people around you, but you still feel very alone or very rejected. And to get out of that, uh, you got to take the risk of leaving the FBI. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's scary, but I think worth it for sure. Yeah. And I think of, you know, being a pastor, and I think of what Jesus would describe himself. I, I imagine from what I've read in the Bible and from my intuition on interpretation, he would describe himself as love. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, he didn't describe himself as a Christian, that's for sure. No, he didn't. But I do think that, uh, yeah, he was, he was definitely. I mean, the embodiment of love, and uh, he, really, he really pushed people to a place of the kingdom is not beyond you, <clears throat> excuse me, but the kingdom is within you, and that God's kingdom is really ruled by one command, which is to love, and to love unconditionally. And I believe at the U training, what we teach people and what we're going after is how do we love ourselves unconditionally? And how do we really learn to love ourselves unconditionally? Because I know if I love myself unconditionally, uh, I'm going to emit to the world unconditional love. Yeah, and for me what that looks like sometimes is I feel like I have so much divine light pouring on me from the outside, pouring onto me, that it, sometimes it creates shadows on the mm -hmm. inside. And that I have this heart center in me that can also radiate light to bring light to those shadows. And sometimes that's very scary. Sometimes that might be getting rid of an FBI or talking about something that's not so comfortable or talking about my flesh or human judgments that I'm not proud of but I have them for whatever reason. Maybe it's a conditioning, maybe it's the environment that I'm in. Awesome, dude. Um, yeah. And that's scary, but well worth it. Yeah. We talk about at the U Training the cycle of fear. And the cycle of fear is separation, fear of exposure, uh, and then control. And when we feel separate, we're afraid. What happens is we feel all this guilt and shame, and that guilt and shame compounds, and then we're afraid of uh, our behavior, sins, guilt and shame uh, being exposed, and then what we do is we try to control our environment so none of that happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, because surely if we're in a performing world and they see that I'm not performing well, uh, especially when no one's looking, I'm not performing well, and if they see that, then what are they going to do? They're going to disconnect from me. They're going to separate themselves even more. They're going to not accept me. And the pain of that feels too much. So what we do is we control through our performance so we're not exposed. But it takes us down that bad path of even more separation. And uh, that's, what, that's what you're hitting on is uh, to break out of that uh, fear of exposure, separation, and control cycle, we really have to step into, I think, to acceptance. Yeah. Yeah, even the shadowy sides. That's right. I, uh, I definitely think that there's part of us that I want to overcome is maybe the, or just be in touch with the ego side is maybe addicted to fear, shame, and mm -hmm. guilt. And that sometimes I can uh, get a little more, you know, freedom from that when I expose light to it, when I embrace, like, feature my flaws or, you know, talk about these shame, like talk about shame like we talk about the weather. You know, a lot of people talk yeah. about the weather or sports all day, but I like to talk about my shadows like that. And it's so liberating that it's almost yeah. addictive for me. Yeah, Danimal's an inspiration. I think all the, all the brothers have been an inspiration for me uh, in really talking about uh, some of these taboo issues, some of these shadows that are within us. Just talking about them like they're just... Uh, like you said, talking about the Cowboys playing on Sunday. <laughs> and, you know, that feels really good to yeah. be in an environment where you can uh, be known. I think we all want to be known, not just in our good parts, but also in the parts that feel uh, feel not so good. Yeah, and that uh, brings me up to this, that, and I think we both are on the same page with this, that pain denial is real suffering, and that... The idea of anger turned inward is depression. Yes. And I remember it being at your conference. I was like, for sure, man. Like, depression is suppression of mm -hmm. emotions, which are energy emotion. The more we suppress those, 
the more it kind of builds up to this icky yeah. feeling. Oh man. And that, uh, man, I can't tell you how many times I've, when I was like really scared to say something to someone and I, or if something, there was something coming up and I didn't let it come out, I would get this, a suppressed or a depressed feeling. Yeah. And I'll tell you what uh, feels so much better than that is letting it out. Letting it out can be scary. Letting it out in a loving way can be very scary. It can make, I, make, I feel my, make, me, make myself feel very vulnerable, yeah. but it feels so much better yeah. than that depression feeling. I, I know Danimal, I love Danimal for many reasons, but one of the cool things about him, he loves life hacks. These life hacks that are really, really like, and so I'm going to give you one of my hacks to connection. And uh, I think that that energy, and Danimal talks about this as well, but that energy that we have called fear really uh, is, is the catalyst to our, uh, our, our growth and our elevation as people. It's a catalyst for connection. And I think we need to start, uh, stop labeling that energy, that faster energy that we feel when we're about to break through or we're about to say something to someone. Break on through to yeah. the other side. <laughs> I didn't listen to doors lately. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so when we're about to break on through to the other side, there's this fast energy and we can either ride the wave or we can suppress it. And uh, I think it, I think, uh, to catch that wave even greater and to become more consistent in catching that wave, we have to rename that energy. And so I, I, when I feel that, I'm, I'm not calling it fear, I'm afraid to do this anymore. I'm calling that energy growth. That I am, I, I start going, okay, this is growth and this is greater connection. So when I feel that, that energy has been renamed. And uh, so when you start to feel that fast energy, like, oh, I don't know if I can do this or not. Call it growth, call it fun, call it connection. Uh, whatever really word really turns you on or uh, means growth or transcendence, go for it. Uh, don't call it fear. Yeah, you hear that. A lot of wise people have said that outside your comfort zone is where all the growth takes place. And that's what our whole idea about turning what's uncomfortable into fun comfortable. Someone that said that the other day about being awkward and I was like, I realized I don't even know if I know what awkward means anymore because I think I've been so, I've gotten so used to chasing that feeling of fear or the uncomfortable, what I would call the fun comfortable feeling, but it just feels kind of good to me. Yeah. It feels like almost like catching a, a like going after a really uh, bigger wave or a scary wave. It's not, I wouldn't call that like, a, if a big wave comes in, I wouldn't be like, that's awkward. Yeah. I'd be like, that was kind of scary. Like, I, I wish I had a little more courage. Hopefully it comes again. <laughs> you know? yeah. Or if I went after it, I was like, that was fun. I yeah. got beat up and I grew a lot. Yeah, that's awesome. I think, I think we all want to ride that energy. And uh, yeah, riding that energy uh, is, is where our growth is. It's where our dreams are. And I'm seeing that in my life. It's, it's where connection really is. And we all desire, I desire connection so much. I want connection with it myself, with God, with everyone around me. And I'm, I'm learning that connection is in that fast energy of fully being known. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. No secrets, man. Or less secrets, less secrets. Yeah. Yep. I see it right here. I see another one. What is best for you is best for the world because love is at our core, which it seems like we just talked a lot about. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to know out there what matters to you really matters to God. What matters to you is really important, no matter how big or how small. Sometimes the small things are the things that are the the things that really want to nurture us and really want to comfort us and really want to connect to uh, the deepest places of our heart. So even the small things that are in your heart, uh, they matter. They really matter. That's good. And I see feel good, feel God. Yeah. Yeah, feeling good always produces uh, a greater connection with God. Always remember this, the three, uh, um, the three things of ego. Uh, an ego creates separation and disconnection. Uh, the, three, the three attributes of ego are I am what I have, I am what I do, I am what other people think. And when you're operating in ego, ego always leads to disconnection and separation. And it leads to you not feeling good, therefore not feeling God. And so when you are defined by, I am what I have, I am what I do, and this is a big one, man. This is one I've really struggled with. This is the avenue of ego that I've uh, uh, just, just I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of it right now, ripping that thing. You know, instead of ripping that thing, I'm really accepting that it's there. 
Uh, I haven't wanted to accept it, but it is there, and that is the avenue of I am what other people think. Mm. I've noticed I spent a lot of my life trying to control what other people think about me, and that's exhausting. Yeah, it's got to be tiring. Oh, I, mean, man. I know it's tiring for myself. Yeah. I know it's less tiring to let go of that a little bit. Oh, man, it's felt so good letting go of that, and... Uh, yeah, just learning to accept even that side of me. That was a shadowy side that I did not want to accept. And uh, I'm starting to accept that. And um, I accept, when we accept, that's where freedom is. And so, uh, yeah, so that's a part of ego that I really struggled with. And when I would align to I am what I, I, am what I have, I am what I do, I am what other people think about me, it creates separation every time. And, uh, I just so, think that's a huge point what you're saying there. I want to make sure this is something people understand. But you may have heard the saying, what resist, persist. Yeah. And you kind of clarified there, you kind of corrected yourself that you're not trying to rip it out of you, but you're trying to accept it. Yes. That I think that people, some people might hear this and be like, oh yeah, I, can't, I don't care what anyone thinks about me. I don't, care what, I don't think that's the answer. No. I think the more you resist that, the more you're going to care. But if you can come to the point like, man... I'm, I was I got distracted during this conversation. Timothy's an expert at this, but or I know a few people are good at this. Like I, I was just so uh, jealous of you in that moment that I didn't even know what you were saying, and I just care so much what you think that I got distracted. Mm. And then that's when they feel free when they really just admit it. Like they have a part of them that we people care. So we all care. Yeah. So I mean I don't know I haven't met many people that don't care what people think about them. Yeah. But the people that seem to be able to live with the most freedom around that are the ones who accept it and admit it. That's right, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, performance-based identification keeps us, or function-based identification keeps us from just accepting all parts of us. And when we're, when we're, we're our, our value is determined by what we do, uh, or when our value is determined by what other people think about me, uh, I'm, I'm, of course I'm not going to allow them into the parts of me that aren't so great, that aren't performing well. And so we, we have a process called down, down, up, which is the first layer down is performance-based identification. And we've got to jackhammer through that and really, uh, man, I, I'm not what I have, I'm not what I do, I'm not what other people think about me. And then there's a, the second down is dealing with the emotional pain. And we talked about this, like, like, uh, anger turned inward is depression and at the very top layer of this second level is this surface frustration and anger and any of you out there that struggle with this surface frustration or anger just really frustrated or you're, you're depressed know that this is the second level and what it's rejoice in that man like I'm feeling something yeah that's actually a good thing I'm feeling something but what happens is, is we stop right there rather, t rather than taking it all the way down to sadness. And the reality is we're just sad. At the base of this level is sadness. And uh, allowing yourself, we all grew up in homes, our, I don't want to uh, put that on you. I grew up in a home where uh, we denied our pain really well. And especially sadness. We weren't allowed to be sad. And so... Uh, there's a lot of suppressed emotions. There were a lot of suppressed emotions in me and I'm still dealing with that and, and, and learning that sadness is okay. And once we go through that surface frustration and let it come down to sadness, have a good cry, feel it, feel it, feel it, what happens is we hit gold, we hit Eureka and that's our most loved self. Mm -hmm. And that's when we're able to take off. So down, down, up. You're not what you do, you're not what, you're ha what you have, you're not what other people think about you. And then that opens you up to, man, you start to feel, 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 and what I'm feeling feels anger, I feel anger, I feel depressed. Take it down, ride it all the way down to sadness, let that energy come out, and then you're like, have you noticed when you just had this great cry, you can really feel the best part of you. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I can't empathize that too much, I'm still working on it. <laughs> But I'll tell you, I learned this about myself, and maybe you had a similar experience in tennis, but in baseball, there's no crying in baseball. Mm. And you've heard it. You've heard that in famous movie quotes. There's yeah. no crying in baseball. And I realized that I'm so good at hiding that emotion. I don't even, I can't even, I haven't even figured it out yet. 
Yeah. Uh, and I think I trained myself like 12, because my, my most emotional times of my life growing up were in baseball. Mm. And when you, I struck out or made an error, it wasn't like I cried. No, you yeah. just keep going. You, That's right. Yeah, I think you had that same that, that, was, that was awesome what he just said. When, I, when I'm supposed to feel, what did I do? I just kept going. Yeah. yeah and so yeah. what we've and learned as people, expert. became an expert. expert that. Yes, yeah. we become an expert at bypassing how we feel to do what, to keep producing and to keep performing, rather than no, I'm going to take the time to feel. And when you take the time to feel, what you do is you allow your kids to take the time to feel. You you allow your wife or your family or your friends to feel. And when they get around you, now they feel like there's a safe environment. Rather than, oh, when I get around Brandon, I've got to produce and perform for him to like me. And you know what? I'll just be, I mean, that's, that was a big part of my world uh, is, is putting pressure on people to perform. And uh, so I, I, am a, uh, I, I am a recovering uh, <laughs> uh, performing addict. You know, I mean, it really was my medication and it really was uh, my drug of choice was to be uh, an overachiever, overproducer. Yeah, I really that hit me one day because I, I sometimes I can cry when I'm watching like little chick flick movies, mm -hmm. like the weirdest times. I'll just start kind of crying. I'm like, man, I think it's because I'm by myself. I learned. I, I actually still. I'll repeat it again. I became so much practice at it. I'm not sure how I let it out in front of other people, but I still feel it's healthy for me to do it by myself if I can. Yeah. Um, and that was baseball, man. And I and I hang around baseball players. It reminds me of my old mm -hmm. self real quickly. Yeah, like real sarcastic, which you, you, I remember you coined that, or you said that phrase, scarcastic. Yeah. And I, that used to be me, and I, it triggers me now when I'm around people, because it probably reminds me of my old self. Yeah. They are just super sarcastic and whatever, yeah. if it's the fear of intimacy, that they just keep throwing jabs because they don't want to feel anything. It's like this, they're putting all their forces out there so they can't feel. And that's, if, if, if you are a person that is sarcastic, or you have friends that are sarcastic, uh, that's really your attempt for intimacy. But what it is, it's fear's version of intimacy coming through a lens of pain. And so, scarcasm, uh, that word sarcasm, sartar, it really means to cut, to slice. Uh, and so every time we use sarcasm, we say what we mean but do not mean what we say, uh, it, it cuts at the person rather than draws Danimal and I closer. It really cuts, and uh, what we want is we want our hearts to be closer. And I've really seen this with Danimal. I want to just applaud him and affirm him. The tenderness that 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 that, that Daniel has had in the last year that, that 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 I've known him, man, he's really embodying this message of heart connection because he he has you've become so much more tender. You can really feel it being around you. There's this real softness and a real approachable. Uh, yeah, you become very approachable. And it just feels good being around Danimal now because there is this softness, this tenderness. That And not to say it wasn't great to be around you, but it's getting even better yeah. because of that. Yeah, it's taking practice, taking time. But uh, I, I, that was the atmosphere in the bullpen. You, you go hang out in the dugout for a baseball team. Especially when you get to high school level or greater, everything is just a little sarcastic remarks. Yeah. And I, and I think that's just because they're probably feeling a lot and that's the way they're protecting themselves. Yes. Which, man, it's, it's brutal. It's a great sport, but that's a brutal atmosphere. The idea of no crying in baseball. I mean, if I were a baseball coach, there's going to be lots of crying. <laughs> we'll make lots of times for errors. Like, I love a timeout. Let's go, well, yeah. shortstop was a cry right now. He had a <laughs> ground ball went through his legs. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll have a little. <laughs> Danimal Bambino's running around to, instead of telling them to dry it up when they come yeah, back to the dugout. Yeah, that's can, rough. That's rough. Tell them to feel. <laughs> yeah, it's not war. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> that, and which reminds me, I like this one. I wrote this one down. The same walls that keep pain out are the same that keep love out. Yeah. Your heart remembers. Yes. Always, always uh, know that that uh, this. This protective layer we have, which is FBI, function-based identification or performance-based identification. Sometimes it's gift-based identification, which is GBI, which that almost sounds Russian. Um, <laughs> uh, but know that that is that protective layer 
it keeps you protected at time. It does, or you wouldn't use it if it didn't serve you at some level. But what it does, man, it, it, it really keeps love out. It keeps the walls high. It keeps people around you that have to jump these high walls just to be in connection and relationship with you. And, and that's just not a good feeling to, to be around someone that has thick, thick, high walls that you can't even penetrate. Um, and, and I don't desire to be that type of person. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and honestly, I don't desire to be around people that you've got to jump through hoops just to be around. And uh, that's what happens when you live by that. It does keep people out and keep some pain out, but man, it keeps all that love, all that connection. It keeps being known. Uh, it keeps that intimacy, that ooey gooey intimacy. It keeps that out as well. Yeah, and um, just on another subject, kind of going back a step, uh, because I have ADHD, ambitious, defiant, happy animal. A lot, I know both of us, we both just try to turn our challenges. Some people call them weaknesses. And I, I'm a big believer, and I think you are too, in kind of renaming things, just like mm -hmm. you said, with the, where I was saying with the uncomfortable and uncomfortable, and you were saying that you should change fear into growth. Yeah, growth and connection. Yeah, I think that's great. And I, that's one thing. I'm renaming these acronyms that people like to, like, it's crazy to diagnose a kid with a disease because he has a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah. But I think I would probably be diagnosed with, like what I said, ADHD. And I, it reminded me of a step back that I wanted to talk about. <laughs> now I'm okay, dude. Look at that. I'm, I'm just talking, I'm, I'm displaying my ADHD right here. What was I going to say? What did you know? Uh, a guy that knows me really well told me, he said, Brandon, if you have not lost your place three times during the conferences that you do, you are not uh, that you're relying too much on structure, you're relying too much on uh, your mater materials to lead rather than you leading. So losing your place is for me is, is a sign that I am I'm in the moment. That's so true because a lot of times people will study, study, and just regurgitate, and you don't get to feel that passion. Or, no. Vibrant. So I'm just going to admit, I forgot. I'll get back to you when I remember. <laughs> but I, I like when you talked about the sympathetic giving, how that equals codependence, and giving yeah. from scarcity is actually taking. Yeah. So if you want to talk about that for a second. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're so used to giving when we do not have anything to give. We're so used to living empty. And we do not know how to fill our cup up. And so when we give... Uh, beyond our capacity, when we give out of an empty cup, it really is not giving at all. It's taking. And, uh, but it looks good because we're, we're, we're defined by our, uh, I am what people think about me. So we, we get into this really, uh, I'll, control, uh, I'll control what people think by what I do. And I'm going to do stuff that looks good, but really I'm taking. And that's what we call sympathetic giving, giving out of lack. And sympathetic giving produces codependency. It produces a connection, a powerless connection, or, or a connection where one is powerful and the other is not. Mm -hmm. And it produces a tie that is not healthy, that's fear-based. And so that, that codependence is rooted in, uh, it's rooting in uh, two incomplete people coming together to try to make a complete person rather than what would it look like for a person that's full coming together with another person that's full and they, they, they come together, uh, we call this uh, individuals coming together in love and equality for the purpose of growth. Individuals, you first have to be an individual, coming together in love and equality for the purpose of growth. Mm. Uh, that, the opposite of that, a codependent relationship or connection is the mutual accommodation of self-need. And uh, when you come together out of swapping need, uh, what creates the relationship will always have to sustain the relationship. And so uh, need, needs, 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 needs are what's always going to sustain your relationship. And what happens when the person in your life realizes they can get their needs from themselves? Hmm. Uh, then there's no longer a need for that other person. You see that in marriages a lot. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and, and the relationship is built out of, well, you complete me. Well, that's very unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and I like the, um, even this note you hear, it's like we're not here to protect people from pain as pain is healing. Mm -hmm. I love that one. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, someone just once did that to me. I was like sharing one of my stories that was making me feel really uncomfortable. It was actually about uh, some cannabis use, and I've done some videos on that if you're interested. And he, and at the end of the, <laughs> here I am, like kind of I can feel my body had a reaction. I'm getting because I thought he was like judging me hard because he just had this look on his face. He's like just looking at me, and then after I'm like. Um, the way for reaction, and afterwards, like, yeah, I use cannabis all the time to kind of open up my consciousness. And I was like, dude, you didn't say anything the whole time. Like, here I am, like squirming in my own skin. I'm like, wait a minute, thank you, brother. I got to feel that fun, comfortable feeling and like grow from it instead of him just being like, I call it the bobblehead syndrome. Like, you know, yeah. people you kind of do it now, but you probably actually agree. Yeah. I mean, sometimes people don't even know what you're talking about. They're just like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, and they're just like, I'll never, never that. So I like that, that uh, <laughs> we're not here to protect people from pain, this pain is healing. And you even <laughs> mentioned about Jesus having selective healing. Yeah, I, I mean, took a note about that. I mean, you got to think, uh, Jesus didn't rid the world of every disease or every sickness that he, uh, that was in the planet at the time he was on the earth. I mean, uh, uh, you know, there was, he healed from a place of compassion, not from a place of sympathy. Just because there was a need there, it didn't mean that he had to react. Uh, and I want you to know that just because there's a need there, it doesn't mean you have to react. A lot of times when you react out of need, it's not about healing the need or fix, helping that person in that need. It's about you not wanting to feel pain and you not wanting them to feel pain. Uh, you learned as a child to really keep your... Uh, we, we learn as children growing up in these family structures that deny pain, we learn that uh, we learn our job is to help everyone not to feel pain. So we've got all these little peacekeepers, not peacemakers, there's a difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. We've got all these little peacekeepers running around trying to keep the peace so nobody feels pain. So mom and dad don't have to feel any pain, we'll just keep the environment really really safe and we'll just make sure we're all okay. Or uh, Instead of, you know, what we do when we don't go through pain, when we go around it rather than going through it, we turn 40 day journeys into 40 year journeys. Mm. Yeah, it reminds me of a story we tell. Timothy usually tells it at the retreats. I'm not sure if you were there about the bird flying south for the winter. Um, I'm not sure. I'll tell a quick yeah. a bridge version. Basically, there's a flock of birds flying south in the winter, and one of the birds gets kind of left behind. He's getting weak, he's getting cold, he's getting emaciated. Sure enough, he falls to the ground, and he's just kind of dying. He's basically yeah. coming to his death, he's freezing to death. Sure enough, a big cow comes by and takes a big crap on him. And he's like, you know, at that point, like, how much worse can it get? Here you are, die, freezing to death. Your whole flock has left you, and then a bird, I mean, a cow craps on you. Yeah. A cow pile on you. Yeah. Uh, but sure enough, that cow poop being more, as warm as it is, as nurturing as it is, all of a sudden it started to regain its health, regain its vitality, and, like, actually warmed it back to health. And mm. the bird starts squirming around. He's, like, shaking the poop off him, getting ready to fly. But in the midst of shaking around that poop, uh, a cat notices a poop pile moving, and the cat comes by, sees the bird in there, and eats the bird, <laughs> and kills it, it's dead, life is done. <laughs> and this the moral of the story is, your enemies are not always the people that sh crap on you. That's right. And your yeah. friends are not always the ones that pull you out of crap. Man. Wow. Huh? And you see that in our retreats a lot, because our retreats are very, like, uh, sometimes very impactful and intense sometimes, sometimes intense stuff comes yeah. up a lot of suppression all comes out at once yeah and you get these sometimes i'm not saying it's a bad thing but maybe it's not the best thing for growth these people that want to come save them like comfort them oh, like, don't yeah. cry don't cry yeah. and i think it's kind of projection they don't want themselves to cry right. they can't, so they're trying to help that person not cry but in reality it's not the path to the most growth like me i, I it's hard for me sometimes but just letting them let it all out and just sit there and Empathy over sympathy That's right. has been a big yeah. lesson for me in these retreats. Yeah, yeah. you can tell when uh, someone's crying and another person wants to put their hands all over them. Yeah. It's oftentimes not about the person crying, it's about that other person feeling uncomfortable because there's deep emotion taking place. And so yeah. they're trying to make it stop. Uh, They're reflecting something that person is uncomfortable or has neglected. That's exactly right. And so it uh, usually causes more damage than good. And, uh, so for sure. Yeah. I, w I want your audience to know that pain is not the enemy, but the denial of pain is the enemy. Boom. And pain denial mm -hmm. is suffering. Mm -hmm. And so pain is not your enemy, but suffering is your enemy. 
And uh, I want you to know that you do not have to suffer. Will there be pain and stuff that happens in your life and trouble? Yeah, there's, there's stuff that happens. But you, you don't have to deny the pain. That's where, man, that's where the suffering is. Uh, that slow, dull headache that you just constantly live with. That's suffering. Man, I love it. That's what I love about the retreats and different events people are doing these days, like what you're doing, where we can get to a point where we can almost celebrate someone going yeah. through a painful process. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's awesome. I like, I like that language. <laughs> I celebrate what you're going through. Yeah. Um, we're getting to the 45 minute mark on the audio here, so I definitely want to talk about the money. Maybe this will be like kind of like a way to hook people in. Um, and which I see is a good way to start is you had this uh, story about racehorses. Yeah. How they perform from right. care rather than for care. That's right. Racehorses, uh, racehorses perform from care. Plow horses perform for care. And uh, I think you're, uh, if you're anything like Danimal and I, uh, we're racehorses, man. And I'm, I know we attract. So I know there's a lot of racehorses on this, uh, on this video. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, what does it look like for you to start to take care of yourself like you were a racehorse? And not to be that, we've learned that plowing and being a plow horse and I've got to do, 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 do and always be doing and that's the best thing. Well, not really. Uh, not if you're a thoroughbred. Um, <laughs> what happens is, is you wear yourself down and then when, it's, then when it's really race time, you don't have anything to give. You're spent. And uh, I believe that it is so important to start investing into yourself, taking care of yourself, filling your cup up. Always remember this, what's in the cup is for you, what overflows from the cup is for everyone else. That's why so, I didn't offer you any coffee. The, <laughs> so you've got you've to fill up your cup first. Uh, and you've got to learn how to fill up your cup and know that that's not selfish, that that's very self-full. And when the time is right, you have something to give. A lot of you out there uh, you're writing. You're writing hot checks emotionally because you just don't have anything to give. And when uh, someone uh, turns in that gift, that check to the bank, uh, it's insufficient funds. And if it wasn't really a gift. Then it turns into something that's, uh, man, it just just doesn't feel good. For sure. Like I think about the analogy how you're saying people go around with an empty cup trying to fill other people's up. Can you imagine like if yeah. I poured Brandon this little bit of like. Sour, it might be even almost like borderline souring milk, coffee, kind of old, backwashy, yeah. versus like a, a champagne cup just spilling over. Then you're gonna get like the fresh, good but, champagne. But, but, but what we say is, oh, oh man, this is so awesome. I, what I'm giving you is the best, and this is amazing. And I'm like, what? It's amazing? This looks like your backwash. Yeah, you know, this looks funny. like what you drank last night or early this morning, and it's. Uh, it's, cold. It, it's cold and it's just, and, you know, and, and there, there, we call that the integrity gap. There's a huge integrity gap because people will not invest into themselves. And that's something that I had to learn to do, that, uh, to really pour into me. And in pouring into me, you know what's happening? I'm becoming greater for the world. And I'm dropping this idea of trying to transform the world. What I'm really focusing on right now is nurturing and caring for Brandon. And what that's producing in my world is an environment that feels very nurtured and cared for. It's very loved and connected awesome. to. Awesome. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I just don't want to get cut off again, so I'm just going to do this myself. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah, that's great. I mean, that's, that's so challenging for people. I, I just see it. This is something I've become more passionate about is helping people invest in themselves. And yeah. because we're offering a retreat that people want to come on, but they let something stop them. Yeah. Um, and I think it's that, like you, that even at your conference, you said the night I invested in myself, like I want others to invest in me, is the night I took ownership to the deed of my own life. Is that yeah, how you said it? that's right, man. I took the title deed. We we want others to invest into us uh, at a certain level. When the reality is, we won't take ownership of our life and say, I'm willing to invest into myself, like I want everyone else to invest into me. The moment I did that in my life, uh, it was about me knowing that this person over here had something for me and had something that could really help me as a person. You want to tell the story a little bit? Yeah. The rich person yeah, that. yeah, it was, uh, I went to a conference not knowing anything about the conference, but knew I was supposed to go. Kind of like someone out there wanting to go to Danimal's 
uh, a Rob Ross retreat. You know, it's really resonating with you. You don't even really know what it's, what they do or what it's about, but you can just feel there's a resonance. That's what I felt. And so my wife and I, we went from Texas to San Diego and we went to this conference and had an opportunity to, uh, at the end, to uh, invest and work one-on-one -on -one with this guy that I knew could really help me. But it was, uh, it, was a, it was a hefty price tag and it was all the money that I had and it was the money that I was using to build a house. And we bought the land and we had the plans for the house and we were about to build the house and you know, it was, it was, it was over $80,000. Mm. And I invested that money into me like I'd always wanted others to do. And that moment that night, Jenny, my wife and I, that's my wife, we were sitting on a hot, at this hot tub overlooking uh, the Pacific Ocean, overlooking uh, Torrey Pines Golf Course, and we felt it. We felt it energetically that we owned our life. Like we had the title deed to the real house. Not the little house we were going to build, but the real house, the house, our dreams. We, had, we got it. We owned it because we, we took that step. And so I would challenge you guys, what, if, if it's a Rob Ross retreat, if it's a you training, whatever it is, man, like take that jump. Mm. Like money, when we say I don't have money, what we're saying is uh, money's a representation of energy. And so really what you're saying is I don't have enough energy. So my, ch my challenge to you is if you feel a resonance to go on a Rob Ross retreat, build up your energy mm. and the money will be there. Take a step. Once you take the action, the money will come. Where what where your intention goes, energy flows. Okay, where your intention goes, energy flows. So put your intention on going on a retreat, and the energy of money will come. So take that step. I just want to challenge you to do that. I like um, that challenge. I like that challenge for myself every day. Sometimes I feel like I have that. I should on myself. Mm -hmm. I should be doing this, or I should be doing that. And there's been several times when I do something else I actually really want to do. That feels good, like going to surf maybe a little farther away or get a massage, and all of a sudden things happen without me yeah. even putting that much uh, should or obligation on it. Yeah, and it seems sort of miraculous. And I know, as for a skeptic, maybe a skeptic's like, well, this is just a good sales tactic, which it is. I think that's a it's, yeah. it is a strategic sales tactic in a way. Not that yeah, and I have I have no problem, like like say no problem. There's still some twinge, but right here, I don't. As far as in the conscious, I don't feel a problem with saying, "Hey, if you feel a resonance to go on a Rob Ross retreat, pay the money to go." So how do you like, get someone to? Because we, I know people want to, and people that have done it, they're like, "Man, you know, a lot of people. You can read the testimonies. They had a great time, even though they took a big risk." Yeah. And I think you, when you, I heard you talking about your investment of eight thousand dollars, and people coming on our retreats that didn't think they could, that they walked by faith instead of sight. Yeah. And I even see a note here about how you say uh, sight is a function of your eyes and vision is a function of the heart. So how do people tap into that? Like how do they overcome the skepticism, overcome the fear, overcome what they see and really tap into that idea that they want to take action now that life is limited, mm -hmm. that I need to invest in myself, like yeah. I, I want others to invest in me. What is the... The heart, they're, they're finding out electromagnetically is 5,000 times stronger than the mind. Okay? 5,000 times. I want you to hear that stronger than the mind. So know that you've protected yourself with the mind, but when your heart feels something, uh, it's like, oh, I don't know. But know when you act on the heart that you're tapping into a 5,000 times stronger energy than you being calculated. And that's what Jenny and I did, man. We tapped into that, and you know what? Uh, within a year, we've had massive success. I have people that pay me uh, six, six, over six figures to coach them. And because what I did, what I wanted others to do, and so it freed something up for so others to do. Was that a real it. big step that moment when you? Oh, it was massive because I, I want. I mean, I wanted to invest into myself at that kind of level because, and, and I really, I want people to want me to impart into their life at that level. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't challenge people to that place into that place of elevation if I wasn't willing to go there, and so. That's so true. A lot of times you'll get people doing affiliate programs that, uh, and people never even bought the product themselves. That I don't think it's an effective way to sell anything if you didn't invest in it yourself. Yeah. But for the people that took the step, and I've been taking that step more and more, kind of investing. In, I, I used to not. I never looked at money as much as an obstacle, as like 
I would find ways around it. Mm -hmm. But now I'm finding it might just be easier sometimes to invite or you know kind of yeah. get more money. It's almost like a, it's almost like bananas. Right. Like I don't look at bananas as like I have a shortage of bananas. I know how to find right good bananas. I found the strategy. Awesome. And so I, Daniel, Daniel's getting free of his hang up with money because it is. It's just like the energy of bananas. Money is the same energy, but we have this big, uh, big hang up with it. Like it's some big deal. Uh, and and for some of you out there, some of you skeptics out there, uh, I think that that there's a there's a scarcity mindset that says. Uh, well, if Brandon has money, it's taking away from me. If Danimal has money, then it's taking away from the people in Africa. And, and I'm here to say, no, there, there's enough for all of us. There's plenty. They print that stuff off. Of there's plenty. Office. That would be like, you know, you're saying, okay, so Brandon needs to become poor so the people in Africa can become rich. It's like saying, uh, Brandon needs to become evil so that the people in Africa can become good. Yes, it's, and it's definitely that that mindset that make runs sense. rampant. Yeah, that just does not make sense. Uh, that's a very scarce scarce mindset when uh, there's really an abundance of resource out there for us all. And uh, so Daniel increasing is not taking away from you. It's actually adding to you, and it's giving an giving you an opportunity to experience just as much abundance that he's in. Yeah, and I'm still working on that because I think I used to have that, mm -hmm. and I still sneaks up. But I agree. Like if, if I don't, the moment that I start thinking there is a scarcity of bananas, then I probably will have less bananas. Oh, it happens every time. <laughs> the moment you what you fear manifests. And, uh, yeah, I just I think investing into yourself, following your heart, taking that step into uncertainty especially in the energy of money produces, for me, produce the fastest results. And I think it's so important now that because information is just so easy to spread that people are more, because there are more and more entrepreneurs are popping up because there's not a need, like information is not being hidden and you don't have to go mm -hmm. to some place to get the information, just Google it. That people are more and more tapping into like creating their own business, creating their own lifestyle, getting paid to pursue their own passion. And that sometimes it takes what you said. I think it takes like I first need to invest in myself so I can show other people how to do it. Right. If you're not willing to invest in yourself, then I don't see how other people would be willing to invest in you. Yeah, I think That's we're moving from the, from the information age, you know, to the wisdom age. And wisdom comes through subtraction, not through addition. Knowledge and information comes through addition. Wisdom comes through subtraction. So for you to subtract for a season. And, 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 to, and to subtract, to deal with this performance-based identification, to really put your gift down, put your function down and subtract, what it does is it elevates you into a very wise place because you become the embodiment of your message. And so now it's not about the information that you're giving, it's about the impartation and the experience that people receive from your vibration when they're around you. Mm -hmm. Come on. Yes, Banner, sir. Don't yes, shout me down yes. when I'm Good. Yes, one God. Of those. I like this. <laughs> Bless God, my brain. A lot of information and a lot of yeah. knowledge, but I kind of I'm on the same page in the sense maybe what I'm hearing is knowledge is uh, or wisdom is knowledge used. Yeah. Man. So we'll we'll come to an ending here, but if you want to practice some of this knowledge, become a Rob Ross ambassador. Join us on one of our next retreats. We got Austin, October 16th through the 20th. Costa Rica, October 20th through the 24th, Virgin Islands, January 2nd to the 6th, and we're even uh, considering moving to uh, doing a little move around the world and doing one in Australia, late January, early February, maybe Byron Bay, maybe Indonesia, maybe Thailand. So email us if you're involved, if you want to get involved in any of that, if you want to start using this knowledge, uh, really practicing it, or go to a U training. Do you have any events coming up? You know, I have a, an event coming up next, uh, next summer. Uh, right now, we're in a really amazing space that my coaching business is full. Uh, we're only selecting a few extra clients for my coaches as well, and we're starting to put my curriculum. Yeah, and just you can go on my website, brandonhawk.com, H A W K, like the bird. And, uh, you know, I'll post some YouTube videos. You can subscribe to me on YouTube, uh, follow me on Twitter. Friend me on Facebook. You can hit me up all those ways. I'd love to just get to know you guys, and I'm just real honored to be a part of uh, the Raw Bra space. So. For sure. And I'll, what I'll do here at the end is just read a little a few more notes that we didn't get to touch on. So if you want more, it'll be kind of a, 
a reason to follow up with us. And I have a feeling this isn't my last time on a video here with Danimal. Uh, I'm kind of throwing in a shameless plug right now mm. to uh, plug on, plug on to uh, keep podcasting with this guy. I think we've got a good energy when we're together. Yeah, for sure, bro. I like I like that a lot. I see uh, something about full body. Yes, full body. Yes, all in, man. Step all in. I see something about individual healing brings relational healing. Yes, you becoming whole produces a whole world. Leading is not telling; it's listening. Ooh, man! Come on, we need some more listeners out there, don't we? <sighs> Sympathy gives into a need-based reactionary world. Yes, it does. Compassion is heart-based and vision-based. And we will cut it off right there. We'll play maybe, you know, I know different podcasts do different things. They play little games. Um, so in case this does become a podcast, we can play a game. Maybe I'll say some words and you can uh, tell me Ooh. what the first thing you think of. We'll do I like, like a 30-second little thing. You ready? Yes. Uh, what's, that, what's that game called, by the way, when you say something they say the first thing that comes to their mind? Is that popcorn? Popcorn? We'll play a little popcorn if that's what it's called. I know Oprah does it on Super Soul Sunday. She'll have... She'll do, do a little popcorn. That's my favorite part. Oh, yeah? All right. Yeah. So we'll do it, especially for you then. Maybe we'll switch up in the future. But for Brandon, since it's his favorite part, we'll play popcorn. Ready? Popcorn. Ooh, come on. Popcorn. Ooh, kernels. <laughs> purple. Uh, the color purple. Book. Um, wow. Uh, the Heart of the... The Seed of the Soul by Gary Zukov. Car. A Hummer H2 jacked up black ops edition. <laughs> Money. Uh, it's abundant. God. Love. Sex. Woo wee mama. <laughs> Ocean. Oh, place of peace. Dolphin. Georgia, my daughter. And the end. Wow. Oh, heaven. I was thinking doors. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Bird Dog, Brandon Hawk. Thank and you, we will guys. end it. That's pretty good. An yeah. hour and two minutes. It's about, I think, a podcast length.